Good morning. Enjoy the snow that's supposed to be coming. A few announcements as we begin. Church calendars and home discipleship calendars for February are available in the vestibule. Tonight, a hospitality night, no service. Encourage you to invite others into your home or call, maybe, if you don't feel comfortable in someone's home. Wednesday evening at 6.30, Bible study. And prayer, a good time of interacting with God's Word and praying together. Next Sunday morning, following our morning service, it'll be a brief church meeting. And then in the back of the bulletin, Ray and Sherry Miller plan to join our church on Sunday morning, February 14. We will serve as our Sunday church as they plan a church in Ohio, and we'll share more details on that, the Lord willing, next Sunday morning. The service for Priscilla is tomorrow, 9 to 11, a viewing, and then at, I'm sorry, 11 to 1. I don't know why I keep wanting to say 9, 11 to 1, and then the service is at 1 o'clock, and everything is here at the church. And a note from Bill and Jane Killian, along with Joy. Dear friends of Roaring Brook, God bless us and blesses us in many ways, so often we don't see it until the hardest of our days. So thank you so much for the blessing you sent our way when you called, sent cards, and most of all prayed. Thanks so much for the beautiful bouquet of flowers. They were Sally's favorite color. And again from Jane and Bill and Joe in light of the passing of Sally. As we think about worship... We worship God, who is majestic, far beyond us in terms of understanding. Elohim, referring to creator God, is unlimited strength, energy, and absolute faithfulness. And it's in Christ we're accepted in by the Lord, and we're also sanctified. So as we think about worship, we want to count our blessings, singing together, Him, count your blessings.
read a chapter of scripture each week without any comment, reading through the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 10, as Hayden comes to read for us. Ecclesiastes 10. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense. They show everyone how stupid they are. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to to rest. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from a ruler. Fools are put in many high positions, while the rich occupy the low ones. I have seen slaves on horseback, while princes go on foot like slaves. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever quarries stones may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed but skill will bring success. If a snake bites before it is charmed, the charmer receives no fee. Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious, but fools are consumed by their own lips. At the beginning, their words are folly. At the end, they are wicked, madness, and fools multiply words. No one knows what is coming. Who can tell someone else what will happen after them? The toil of fools wearies them. They do not know the way to town. Woe to the land whose king was a servant, and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth, and whose princes eat at a proper time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Through laziness the rafters sag, because of idle hands the house leaks. A feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. Do not revile the king even in your thoughts, or curse the rich in your bedroom. Because a bird in the sky may carry your words, and a bird on the wing may report what you say. Thank you, Hayden, for reading scripture. We'll pray together, and we'll interact with God's word. Father, we thank you again for the privilege of worship. We're grateful for your word. We can read, we can study, we can live. We're grateful for the salvation. Grateful for your faithfulness and working in our lives, along with many other blessings that you give to us. So we consider your word and then we sing and pray in response to your word. We want to be open, attentive, hearing, obedient, living for your glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to challenge us this morning to think deeply concerning the Lord and his dealings with humans. So I've got some questions I want you to ponder and think about, not looking for a response, but to ponder as we interact with Scripture. Would you want to experience love from a person who did not confront evil or become angry? Would you want to experience love from a person who did not confront evil or become angry? Does the Lord repent, if you're using King James, or relent, if you're using NIV? Does the Lord repent or relent? What must be present if there is evil? What must be present? If there is evil. Again, ponder these questions as we read together Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. This is after Jonah has fled, got to prepare to fish. And Jonah spent three days and three nights in the fish, and he talked to the Lord in chapter 2 and then chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. 
Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 days or 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king of his nobles. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from the evil ways, he had compassion and not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This morning we will look at some words that appear in the book of Jonah because they're very important as we understand Jonah. And one word that appears 11 times is the word great. Great in size or extent in chapter 1 and verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And this is after Jonah had fled from the Lord. In chapter 1 and verse 12, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Or the sailors said, what do we do? And Jonah said, throw me overboard and it will become calm. That is, the sea will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. We find in chapter 16 that Jonah, I'm sorry, chapter 1 and verse 16, Jonah greatly feared the Lord. You know, it's a huge fear. And in chapter 1 and verse 17, the Lord provided a great fish. God prepared that. In chapter 4 and verse 1, Jonah was greatly displeased. No, it wasn't just a little bit, it was huge. Another idea in the word great is, you know, something that is important, something that is major. Chapter 1 and verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh being an important city, fairly large city. Chapter 3 and verse 2, when God again gives the command to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh. Again, in terms of size, importance. We find in verse 3, now Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important, same Hebrew word as great elsewhere, important city. A visit required three days. We go over to chapter 4 and verse 11. But Nineveh, this is the Lord speaking, has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city, that important city? Also appearing in the book of Jonah Nine times is the word evil. The idea of evil in its basic term is a rejection of God. Thus there's a standard or some measuring stick. If there's evil, you have to have a measuring stick, you know, something to compare it to or something to say that it is wrong. Evil involves a practice of idolatry, abuse of people, And it also has the idea of causing pain. Nineveh was a city that had idols. But to think about evil, we want to go back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Just a few verses there and then some in chapter 21. And as we think about evil, think about relationships. Exodus 20, we find in verses 1 through 17... The Lord gives what we call the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words to Moses, to the nation of Israel. We're not going to read all 
or the entire chapter, but several verses. And the Lord spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. You should not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on earth beneath, or in the water below. And then he goes on, you shall not bow down to them. In verse 7, you should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. In verse 8, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. In verse 12, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony amongst your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant his donkey, your ox, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And again, the idea is relating to God and relating to other human beings. Look at chapter 21. He's given some laws. Chapter 21 and verse 12. Anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. Look at verse 15. Anyone who attacks his father or mother must be put to death. Verse 16, anyone who kidnaps another and sells him or has him when he is caught must be put to death. Verse 17, anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. And you find repeatedly as you read through the Mosaic Law that evil is tied in with relationships. Whether toward God, or toward other people. And in the book of Amos, just a couple books before Jonah, we find that the same thing is brought out as Amos addresses the nation of Israel. In Amos 5 and verse 11, you trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. Therefore, you have built stone mansions, or therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses, how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and take bribes, and you deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, a prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. So as we think about the book of Jonah and the term evil being used nine times, in three of the instances, it's referring to evil in the term of idolatry, abuse of people, and so on. Chapter 1 and verse 3 of Jonah. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where after paying the fare in that port, he went aboard and sailed from the Lord. And then we know the Lord pursued him. Why? Why did he flee? Because of verse 2. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because its wickedness, its evil, has come up before me. In chapter 3 and verse 8, as the king of Nineveh, he says, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And in verse 10, when God saw that they, or what they did, and they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them. And he did not bring upon them the destruction he has threatened. So as we think about Nineveh, there was evil involved. The term evil is also used in terms of trouble, disaster, and pain. In chapter 1 and verse 7, Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. Calamity is the same Hebrew word as evil. And the idea there is, you know, there's disaster. We find the same in verse 8 of chapter 1. Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble. 
making all this evil, all this disaster. What do you do, Jonah? Where are you from? What is your country? From what are your people? We find also in chapter 4, Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. The term displeased, again, is referring to, or comes from the word evil. What is it? He's greatly distressed. He's in misery. God is dealing with a great city. Evil is central. But then there's another term that is used, and that's anger. Look at chapter 3 and verse 9. We find that the king of Nineveh, in his decree, says, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. If you look at chapter 4 and verse 2, in Jonah, as he prays, he prayed to the Lord. O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sinning, calamity, or difficulty, or evil. Anger. The king of Nineveh saying, well, God's angry. Jonah says God is quick to turn from his anger. And in the Hebrew, the idea of anger ties in with the nose, the nostrils. And you look at a person, you can generally tell when there's anger. You know, it it shows. Jonah was angry. Verse 1 of chapter 4, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. What else does he say? In verse 3, now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. In verse 4, but the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? And Jonah says, yeah, I have a right to be angry. And then we find that the book ends with God addressing Jonah's anger in verse 9. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. Anger involves a heat, a burning. And I think all of us have been through anger a couple times in our life. The king of Nineveh, God must be angry. Maybe he'll turn from his anger. And Jonah is angry at the Lord, the creator of the universe, the one who wanted Nineveh to repent. And I would pose a question, and we'll respond to it. Is anger an attribute of God and part of his character? Let's go to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. We find in Exodus chapter 32 that the children of Israel had set up the golden calf. And we know that Moses has to confront it. But leaping into the context, we find that the Lord is responding Speaking to Moses, Exodus 32 and verse 9. I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. The Lord himself speaking to Moses, then my anger, or that my anger may burn against them. And I'll make you, Moses, into a great people. What is happening? The covenant that Moses had made, or God had made with 
Moses and the children of Israel is being violated, and the Lord's response is one of anger. Let's go to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. Psalm 18, beginning with verse 7. And we find in the context of the psalm that David is writing a psalm ascribing to the Lord praise and so on in light of deliverance. But in verse 7 he says, The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountain shook. They trembled because he, referring to the Lord, was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils. Consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, clouds advanced with hailstorms or hailstones, and bolts of lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemies, and great bolts of lightning and routed them. The valleys and the sea were exposed, and the foundations of the earth laid bare. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of breath from your nostrils. Again, in the context of the Lord's anger. In Jonah, the king of Nineveh speaks of the Lord's anger, and Jonah being anger, or displaying anger. And as you think about the Lord, anger is part of his character. We talk about God's love, which is good, but we can't separate God's love from his holiness, his justice, his mercy. His compassion, his wrath, seeing the totality of God in his character. Another word that comes through or is seen in Jonah, chapter 2 and verse 8. Jonah's in the prepared fish's belly. As he's talking to the Lord, he says, Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And the idea of worthless idols is they're empty. They're unsubstantial. They have no power, ability, in contrast to the Lord. Idols, the term basically means fleeting, wind, a vapor, a breath. It's like going out on a cool morning and you breathe and you see your, the vapor of your breath for a few moments. But in the context of idols, Psalm 115, Psalm 115 Verses 4 through 8. In a psalm that speaks of the Lord in his greatness. It says, But their idols are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but they cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. Jonah speaks of worthless idols. Are idols real? Do they have power? We'll respond to that, Lord willing, in several weeks. Another word that is used several times is the word relent. In chapter 3 of Jonah, verses 9 and 10. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And then in verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them. And did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. He did not bring upon them. He relented. In chapter 4, 
We read this several times already. In verse 2, Jonah knew God. He says, I knew that you were gracious, a compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. The word relent is used 38 times. The word repent is used 38 times in the Old Testament with the majority of the references to the Lord, the Lord relenting, the Lord repenting. Relent or repent means the changing of God's dealings with men, with humans according to his sovereign purposes. A change in humans results in a change in how God responds to them. His character does not change. His purposes do not change. His will does not change. His being does not change. But he does change his responses. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6, in relation to the flood, it says that God relented, repented that he had made man. God created man for fellowship, to care for the earth, to have dominion over the earth. And we know that that did not become a reality. And evil abounded. And God, again, relented. And he destroyed all but Noah his wife, three children, and their wives. In Exodus 32, a passage which we read earlier, God has said to Moses, you know, I'm angry. Let me pour out my anger. And Moses pleads with the Lord. And in verse 14, in light of Moses' prayer, then the Lord relented. Did not, did not bring in his people the disaster he had threatened. Moses stepped in. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 35, we, we find that the scripture speaks of the fact that the Lord repented, if you want to use that term, of making Saul king. Now Saul was to lead the nation of Israel in a good way, and he did not. It says the Lord relented. Now in the context of anger, worthless idols, and the Lord relenting, we find in chapter 4 and verse 2, another word that is used is the great word gracious. Jonah is praying to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sudden calamity. You're a gracious God. Jonah had preached destruction, and God didn't destroy Nineveh. God is gracious. The idea of grace is to show favor. The act of a superior to an inferior who has no claim of gracious treatment. So the Lord, the God, the creator, extends grace not only to Nineveh, but to Jonah and to the nation of Israel. Whether it be Israel, whether it be Jonah, whether it be Nineveh, none of them had a basis for saying, God, you've got to be gracious to us. God acts with favor towards them because of his choice. And in Exodus 34, we find that again, the Lord extends grace. And grace is important as we consider the book of Jonah. Because grace is extended to Nineveh, to Jonah, to the sailors, and to the nation of Israel. Jonah says, you're gracious and compassionate. Gracious, 
compassionate. Maybe we could use merciful. King James Version talks about God being merciful. Apparently Jonah recognized this, that God had been compassionate. He had been merciful. To whom? To Judah. How many times did the prophets come to Judah and confront them and they resisted? Prophets came to Israel and confronted them and they resisted. And God in grace continued to send prophets. And he says, Lord, I knew you were compassionate. You see human beings in their weakness, their helplessness, and their suffering. And it's interesting, the root word for compassionate has womb as its root. When you think of the womb, what do you think of? Care, concern, a baby developing. Also tied in is the seed of emotions. The Lord is compassionate, understanding, weakness, the proneness to sin. Where would Israel have been if it wasn't for the Lord's compassion? And compassion. It would have been judged many years earlier. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and then abounding in love. Abounding in great kindness, if you're using King James. Abounding in love is expressing God's loving kindness and condescending to the needs of his creatures. Ultimately expressed in Christ. Sometimes human beings see the Lord as carrying a big stick. Ready to zap people. I've heard that over and over again. Israel disobeyed repeatedly in the desert. They refused to enter the promised land. They worshipped the golden calf. But yet the Lord was gracious in confronting them again and again. And ultimately they were judged. They complained about food. They complained about water. But yet God in grace responded. And as you think about the attributes of God, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. That is tied in with the fact that he is also just. He is holy. Seeing God in the totality of his character. So Jonah was kind of eager, in some respects, go to Nineveh, preach judgment. But in the back of his mind, as he says in chapter 4, I know that God is gracious, he's compassionate, he's slow to anger, he abounds in love, he relents from sending calamity. I don't think I want to go, because I know what God's going to do. He would have seen that in the nation of Judah, in the nation of Israel. And before the nation of Israel divided, he would have read about it or heard about it repeatedly, that that is what the Lord is like. In his love, the Lord confronts, rebukes, corrects, and disciplines. The intent of those terms is restoration. A lack of response by humans, nations, Israel, and the church in time will result in judgment. But so often he is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger. Abounding in love. Israel, the northern kingdom, ultimately went to Assyrian captivity. Judah went to the Babylonian captivity. Amos pronounces judgment on various nations. So as we see some of the words in Jonah, see God in the totality of his character. And then another word in Jonah just a brief comment, is a great fish. In chapter 1 and verse 17, the Lord provided a great fish. And according to the Hebrew, 
It's not referring to any particular type of fish. God prepared a great fish. The text does not say it was a whale. God prepared a great fish. What kind of fish was it? One prepared by God. Leave it at that. God prepared it, and it served the Lord's purpose. So a couple thoughts in terms of application. We live and respond to the Lord according to his character, how we see him. Stop and ponder how often we respond to the Lord according to how we review him. I've talked to numerous people over the years who said, God must be like my dad. Angry, bitter, out to get me, out to find fault. And then others might say, I see God in a different way because they had a different relationship with dad. But we develop a view of God and Jonah presents a view of God. Yes, there is anger. There is wrath. There is grace. Grace, there is compassion. There is a slowness to anger. There is an abounding in love. And it's interesting, too, that Jonah was angry because he refused to accept the Lord being consistent with his own character. God is consistent with his character. And Jonah says, Lord, I don't like that. That's why I fled. But yet I knew that if I went to Nineveh and I preached, you probably would be gracious, you'd be compassionate, you'd be slow to anger, you'd be rich in love, and you would relent and you wouldn't send judgment on Nineveh. And that's what I wanted. Again, seeing God for who he is. So let me get back to the questions. Would you want to express or to experience love from a person who did not confront evil or become angry? Years ago, there was a husband and a wife. And the wife said to her husband and complained to other people that my husband does not love me. She began to run around with another man who was not her husband. And her husband did nothing. Didn't even try to win her back. If that's what she wants to do, let her do it. And her conclusion was, now I know he don't love me. Because he doesn't try to keep me. He didn't care about her wrongdoing. Love that doesn't confront evil or display anger is not a very good love. Children seem to test mom and dad sometimes. Do you love me? They know mom and dad's standard. They disobey. And mom and dad do nothing. Well, I assume mom and dad don't love me because they never confronted my wrongdoing. What must be present if there is evil? Some type of standard, holiness. As you think about the book of Jonah, you think about Israel. God had come into covenant. He displayed his holiness. Does the Lord repent or relent? Yes, in terms of action due to human change. No, in terms of character, purpose, being, and will. Are we as a church living, responding in light of the Lord's character? Are we pursuing him? Do you or I need to make some adjustments in our thinking to think more like God thinks in terms of who he is and how he responds? And as we think about the Lord's character, we want to respond in worship by singing together. Reflecting on the Lord's character, holy, holy, holy. And then we'll also sing in a few moments. I ask the Lord that I might grow.
And that ties in with God bringing some difficulty into life, some calamity so that we might grow. But holy, holy, holy. As we pray together again, think about God and his character, who he is, and the fact that we have the privilege and the opportunity to pray. I will begin praying for a number of items, and then Arden will be praying for the Howard family. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you for revealing yourself in creation, the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law the prophets, Christ, Scripture. We praise you as Lord, Creator, Sovereign, and being gracious. You bestowed much upon us in our country, beauty, money, material items, good jobs, political freedoms, plus much more. In the midst of abundance, we confess that we at times use our money and possessions and freedoms for our own selfish gain. They become our gods sometimes and they own us. We repent. Keep us sensitive to enjoying your abundance given to us and using it for our good, for your good, and for your glory. Father, pray for those in the body of Christ to experience hardship, and persecution due to their being Christians. And I pray, Father, that those who are being persecuted, even at this point in history, in various countries of the world, that they would rejoice because they're participating in the sufferings of Christ. They would realize they're blessed, when insulted because of the name of Christ, for the spirit of glory and of you rest on them. May they commit themselves to to you, their faithful creator, and just continue to do good. May they meditate upon 1 Peter 5, 10 and 11, and the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory in Christ, after you suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. 
May they relish the fact that they've experienced a new birth. They have a living hope. They have an inheritance that won't perish, spoil, or fade away. I pray to Father that they'll see their trials as an opportunity for their faith to be tested and to be displayed as genuine. I pray for our church, as Paul prayed for the church in Colossae, that you might fill us with the knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And I pray this, Father, in order that we might live a life worthy of you. We might please you in every way, being fruitful in every good work and growing in our knowledge of you, being strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience. And joyfully give thanks to you, Father, since you qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. I pray, Father, for those who are going through difficulty. Pray for Marty, Ryan, Jeff and Elka, Tina and Steve, Tim and Debbie in light of the passing of Priscilla. Minister Grace, comfort. We know that sorrow is difficulty or difficult, but yet you are a God of comfort. Pray, too, for Joy and Jane and family in light of the death of Sally. You might, again, minister grace and encouragement. May the family, these families, know how to humbly depend upon you. Experience you in this time. Pray, too, for those experiencing fear and loneliness due to the pandemic. Know this week, Teachers and students, at least in the Northwest District, will make another shift. And as we go through the trials of life, Father, I pray that we will humbly look to you as our shepherd. And as you minister encouragement, we want to know the greatness of your love and the power that is at work in us. As we go through difficulties, a power beyond what we can ask or comprehend. We choose to rejoice in our trials, and we ask you for wisdom so that character and perseverance can be developed in us. And we also want to be instrumental in reaching out to one another as we go through trials. Experiencing them, Father, for your glory. And pray for those listed in our prayer guide. Tim and Gloria Davis and Arden Alkenny, thank you for them, their love for you, their desire to walk with you. May you give them a spirit of wisdom and understanding to know you, to experience you. And in their daily life, enlighten the eyes of their heart so that they might know the hope to which they have been called. The riches of your inheritance in them, along with other saints. And the power that is at work in them. The power that raised Christ from the dead exalted him to your right hand and made him head of the church. And as these individuals have opportunity to mentor and interact with younger people, they know how to give wisdom, help younger people to live well. May they live with confidence so they can encourage younger people to live with confidence. Not to look at the world, not to look at events, but look at you and live in light of that in daily living. Pray for Tim as he seeks to love and lead Gloria. He'll understand Christ's love for the church, nurture her, cherish her, and Gloria responding, being a compliment, and help her to Tim that their marriage would display Christ in the church. May they know grace and difficulties that they face in life. In their relationships, may they walk worthy of their calling, pursuing humbleness, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another. Then I pray, Father, for Arden as he parents adult children, responds to grandchildren. May he be a grace giver. May he know how to speak wisdom, how to spur his children and grandchildren to live well in the time in which we live. May he have wisdom in encouraging others, know that he seeks to reach out and encourage and bless others. 
wisdom as he continues to do that. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we would continue this morning in prayer, Lord, thank you, Lord, for, as Naomi is saying, the blessed quietness, Lord. We know that we need that, Lord, in our lives each day. But also, as we began our service this morning, count your blessings. You know, Heavenly Father, if we were to be here this morning and and count the blessings that we have received as a church body throughout countless years and countless service by others, Lord, to glorify you and to keep our minds focused on you, Lord, we would be here for many, many days. And one of those blessings this morning that that we can count, Lord, and thank you for, was the Howard family. For when we were beginning to build here and remodel and update, they came here as part of a missionary group, the Baptist Builders. They took took on the responsibility of helping us to get our church up to where it needed to be, Lord. But not only that, they witnessed. And they also took part in all activities and many things which we did together, Lord, that they became a part of our family. The family which we we cherish to this day. So we pray for Brent and Michelle and Ryan and Riley and ask you, Lord, that you watch over them. Continue, Lord, to put your love within their hearts, Lord, that they they have so much of to serve you, Lord, and to be used by you in the talents that you have given them, Lord. And the wisdom, Lord. We pray, Lord, for sometimes how they, maybe not so much now, but they lived in that small, well, not a small camper, but a camper, Lord. And, and really gave up a lot of life to serve you and to serve the areas with which they were serving by building. We pray that, that they do be given your wisdom, God, in continuing to bring up their children in the ways of you, Lord, and to follow you. We pray, Lord, for this time when, like many who are being hampered by this virus that's going around, and it probably affects their lives, Lord, because they they were going to different areas and do different things, Lord, and it's been sidetracked or derailed or whatever, Lord. But we know that they they keep busy serving you and doing your work, Lord. So, Lord, we just pray for these this Howard family, Lord, and, and ask that you keep them in your heart, Lord, and let them know that we're We're there for them, Lord, and they're in our hearts and always will be, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thank you, Arden. As we close our service, we go with the benediction of Jude 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. You're dismissed.